Thank you so much, Chris. I appreciate it. It's a real honor to be here with all of you. Secretary Bellows, Secretary LaRose, thank you very much for those framing remarks. Civic health is such an important theme and it's terrific to have our secretaries of state standing up and really digging in on that question. I'm glad to share with you the work of a commission from the American Academy of Arts and Sciences that released a report last June called Our Common Purpose, Reinventing American Democracy for the 21st Century. My own personal concern about democracy really goes back to 2013. That was the year that Congress had an approval rating of 9%. And I remember seeing that and just for me, that was a red alarm light about the state of civic health in our country. Other things had been causing me worry, but that was really my turning point moment. And for other members of the Academy as well, that concern was building. So by early 2016, there was a conversation in the Academy about the need to dig into the question of how we achieve civic health for our society. By early 2018, we had set up the commission and pulled together a group of more than 35 people. The purpose of the commission was to find solutions to help empower voters, to help increase political and civic participation and to revitalize our civic culture. We were starting from the recognition that trust in government had fallen to new lows, also trust in one another. Yet at the same time, there was a revitalization of local democratic efforts all around the country in a variety of ways. The group that we pulled together represented a wide variety of professional sectors, of demographic backgrounds, and also of ideological diversity. It was really important for us to capture a broad spread of opinion as we did this work. I was privileged to serve as a co-chair for the commission alongside Stephen Hines, president of the Rockefeller Brothers Foundation, and Eric Liu, who runs Citizens University. When we pulled our commission together, we did do some of the things that can commissions conventionally do. We commissioned white papers and dug into the research and empirical indicators around civic health. But we were also quite sure that understanding our situation and finding the solutions forward required talking to people, really hearing, listening to ordinary Americans about why our political institutions were or were not working for them. We ran listening sessions all around the country, about 50 different engagement sessions. We heard from first year students at the Naval Academy, from refugees in Minnesota and Massachusetts and moms in Kentucky. Our groups really covered the range of perspective, conservatives, liberals, independents, even non-voters. And we pulled in people from quite diverse backgrounds, racial, ethnic, religious communities, and people of all ages. As we talked to people, we heard over and over again a sense that our system was broken. We heard over and over again a sense that the only thing that we shared was that we didn't share anything at all. So that was a point of agreement. When we asked folks what they thought Americans shared, the answer was, I, I don't know. I wish we shared something, but, but I don't know. So we are united in our frustration. That is something that we can lift up. And that means as a problem solving people, in fact, we have a resource for addressing our problem. We heard a real fear that our divisions have grown so deep that nothing can unite us anymore. Yet at the same time, over and over again, we heard people articulate love of country. People have different reasons for loving our country. People in different places love different parts of our country. People also have criticisms of our country. The love of country and critical reflection can go together. And that is what we heard all over the country as we ran these civic engagement sessions. What we heard in those sessions became the basis for our report. I mentioned it already, our common purpose, reinventing American democracy for the 21st century. I hope you'll have access to that report and um, you can find it easily by Google um, if you haven't yet had access to it. So your subcommittee is exploring civic health. This is not a simple concept. We really focused on this in our report and it led us to develop a theory of change, a theory of how we can get to a place where we can consider our democracy healthy. We think that this is about pulling three things together, a healthy civic society, a healthy civic culture and healthy political institutions. Often when people work in the space of civic health, they just work in one area. Somebody works on political institutional reform, independent redistricting, for example. Another person works on civic culture, the question of civic education. Yet another person might work on civil society organizations. For example, how is our media ecosystem supporting democracy or not supporting democracy? And what we came to understand from talking to Americans all over the country is that these three pillars have to work productively together. 
we had one person in one of our sessions in Maine who said, you know, look, I, I kind of think we're stuck in a vicious cycle. We have these institutions we don't trust. And then because we don't trust them, we stop participating. And when we stop participating, we don't have as many connections through civil society organizations that link us up to the political system. And then we don't get to know each other. We don't discover shared purposes. And then our civic culture degrades as well. We're trapped in this vicious cycle. And then he said, but, but I think democracy is supposed to be a virtuous cycle. It's supposed to be a cycle where our institutions empower us, where they're responsive, where they're representative. And as we participate in those, in order to participate, we tend to hook up with others. We form groups and associations and have that chance to connect in civil society. And exactly by working together, by trying to solve problems together, we nourish a civic culture that supports mutual commitment to one another and to our constitutional democracy. We came to see the challenge that we all face then as being one of needing to sort of flip the switch, flip the equilibrium from this vicious cycle we're trapped in to a virtuous cycle. So let me give you an example then of how we see this cycle fitting together. We had a set of reforms across these three categories of political institutions, civil society and civic culture. Um, I'll just name one. We advocate in our report for ranked choice voting. We just watched ranked choice voting take place in New York. An extraordinary day, the biggest electorate for a ranked choice election the country's ever seen. Now, for a reform like that to work, though, right, for it to be successful in terms of moderating political discourse, increasing representation, pulling more voters in, people have to understand how the system works. You need a lot of civic education to support the effective use of ranked choice voting. So it really mattered that people be building out educational resources to support civic understanding. And at the same time, you also need a media ecosystem that is really helping people get high quality information about candidates. Um, people are not gonna be able to vote effectively in any kind of election, ranked choice or not, if they don't have a media ecosystem, helping them understand local politics as well as national politics, for example. And we all know we've seen an incredible erosion of local news all over the country. So it's great to have this ranked choice voting reform, but in order for it to succeed, we also need local news that's strong and robust. And we also need civic education that helps people understand how the pieces fit together and can nourish that spirit of participation. So that's the work I think that you are also beautifully positioned to do. We can create the right incentives and right institutional structures to make sure that grassroots democracy is healthy, productive, and effective. But then we also have to create that culture of particip participation and that set of civil society organizations that connect to those strong organizations and institutions. So I wanna focus for the rest of my remarks just on some of the recommendations that really focus on that concept of civic health. The part that is about how we nourish that mutual commitment of all of us to one another and our shared commitment to our constitutional democracy. We recommend creating a culture of national service where there is a universal expectation of service um, for young people. This we imagine could involve building up service programs that give young people the opportunity to play roles in local government. They could play roles in newsrooms as a part of an effort to, to recreate the infrastructure of local news, for example. Many young people serve in the military. We have existing service programs. But what our recommendation proposes is that we try really to extend that to support that universal expectation of service and to make sure there are paid opportunities available for young people across the country. We also think we need to increase transparency in campaign finance and amplify the power of small donors. So these are things that really can be addressed at a state level. Um, there's lots of work on disclosure about money in politics that could be achieved at a state level. Um, there's also opportunities to support public financing or public matching programs at a state level. Um, all of these things are important in order to bring transparency as well as opportunities for participation that broaden the diversity of folks who are running for office and folks who are able to play an important role in lifting people to public office. We recommend the creation of a national trust for civic infrastructure. This would be a public-private partnership started by philanthropy, but we hope reinforced with public sector support. This national trust for civic infrastructure 
but take on responsibility for thinking about some of those backbone pieces that don't always get enough attention. Libraries and parks and the kinds of spaces that support civic gatherings, support people coming together to work together. I've made a few mentions already of the issue of our media ecosystem and the question of its health. We do think it's also important to support innovations in social media to serve civic functions. This is work too that can be done on the state level. Sometimes we think that federal policy is the, the main way to go, but state governments can really help philanthropists connect to other actors to start rebuilding a local news effort. ProPublica is an interesting journalistic example. This is an investigative reporting uh, enterprise that draws on philanthropy to build out newsrooms to support local journalism. Another really important example is a program called Civic Lex based in Lexington, Kentucky. They have started to recreate local news with a combination of digital platforms and in-person gatherings, but they bring two critical principles to the work. These principles really help underscore the powerful difference local news can make for a community. The first principle is that they report on the news before it's all done, as opposed to after. What this means is that as agenda items are moving forward on a town council or county council, they are reporting on the agenda and providing people with the information they need to be informed about decisions that are coming. That way the community can engage and can participate. Another one of their principles is that they support gatherings to discuss issues in the community and have a rule that there can never be more than seven uh, constituents for every public official who's there. So a ratio of, of one official to every seven people. Um, and what this means is that as people gather to talk about local issues, local problems, local decisions, they have to focus on the quality of their relationships with one another. They can't settle into toxic flame, flame wars or something of the kind because that ratio is small enough to really call people to responsibility for their treatment of one another. Another one of our recommendations is that we enhance civic education to prepare citizens to be participatory members of a self-governing community. And here too, there's a lot of good work underway. There are many champions of our recommendations all around the country. One of our champions is an initiative called the Educating for American Democracy Initiative. This initiative issued a roadmap um, in early March to support excellence in history and civic learning for all learners K through 12. And this was an NEH and US Department of Education project. And that roadmap includes a lot of opportunities for states to think about how to invest in civic learning in schools. Um, and again, the secretaries of state's office are powerful here, often supporting things like jury education. Um, there's a lot of room also, I think, to support voter education. And again, as in a completely non-political way, just what does it mean to be a voter? Why is voting important? How does it work? How can we prepare young people to enter into this, this role? So there's a lot of good, good work to do. Um, a final recommendation to mention here is we also suggest making official public meetings and policy making at the local and state levels more accessible, more participatory, more transparent. We've all seen incredible innovation in the pandemic. I'm sure you've all used a whole heck of a lot of Zoom and Google Meet and Teams and so forth for public meetings. And we have the opportunity to maintain that and thereby to increase participation, to make sure that working people are able to connect to their public meetings. So the innovation that was we've seen in the pandemic, we, let's, let's build on that spirit of innovation and see what else we can do to achieve a participatory self-governing community where all can easily participate. So, the last thing I will say um, is just to, to, again, to commend you all for the important work that you do on voting. Um, we recognize the importance of that in your roles. And we do have recommendations on voting in our report. But in addition to the importance of voting, a healthy democracy does really extend beyond that. Um, it is also about volunteering. It's also about serving. It's also about how we narrate our history, our state history and our local history. Civic health brings all of these pieces together. So the last thing I want to emphasize is that as we pulled our 31 recommendations together and worked with communities all across the country and worked with our own group, we strove to find consensus across a diversity of perspectives. We really were a com commission that brought together different partisan positions and views. And our 31 recommendations found a space of consensus. We agreed when we went into the work 
that we wanted recommendations that would be simultaneously bold, but feasible. And also we wanted recommendations that would achieve near unanimity for each one across the board for our commission. So it's certainly true that for every commission member, there's probably something that that commission member didn't agree with, but for every recommendation we had near unanimity on each. And in each case for every single one, we had cross-partisan consensus. So our 31 recommendations do represent a place that people could come together and agree. We inspired ourselves in our work with a quotation from Benjamin Franklin. At the very end of the Constitutional Convention, he stood up and he said, you know, I think that this is the best we can have. It may not be perfect, but I can't imagine a better one. So I will bury here whatever reservations I have and I will sign on and I hope you will all do that. And that is exactly what we did in our commission. We all signed on unanimously, burying our reservations, recognizing that we had found a place of agreement despite difference in diversity and that it was important to be able to build from that. So I commend it to you in that way. I celebrate the work that you're doing. I'm very proud too to have two colleagues from the commission following me in this conversation, Pete Peterson and Carolyn Lukensmeyer. I know you'll learn a lot from conversations with them as well. And thank you for letting me present our work to you.